I'm recording. Sorry, thank you for, uh, Vera, thank you for reminding me. I started recording now. So it's, uh, mm. I used to record via OBS, but it's, it's not that, uh, that effective. Okay, so study manifolds via functions on it and functions which are specifically regular. So critical points of the functions will correspond to Lego, to like pieces or blocks of Lego. And like the way we glue is a bit more subtle and the way we patch them together is a bit more subtle and it's just slightly more advanced thing. So what uh, is an example of a function on a manifold? So we have, for example, we have a sphere and we have a projection to the straight line. So, so the projection to the vertical line and we have a function h which is like a height function and the height function has two critical points. This, the minimum and the maximum. Uh, quite soon you will realize that if a closed manifold of any dimension admits a Morse functions with precisely two critical points, which by all means means one is minimum, the other is maximum, then this manifold is uh, homeomorphic to, to the sphere. It doesn't have to be diffeomorphic. Uh, H has a minimum and a maximum. And now, the, what is Morse function about? We look at the level sets. So like we said, a level C, and we look at the part H inverse of C and H inverse of minus infinity C as C varies. So, well, let me start. If C, if we start below the level set, so below the minimum, then this guy is empty and this guy is empty. Now we increase C. So the point that this goes to R, which is an ordered object. So this is, this has an order. We increase C and then we, lo and behold, we hit the critical point. And at the critical point of H, this is the local minimum and actually global minimum here. Uh, at the critical point you have uh, H inverse is a single point and this guy is a single point. Critical points, so inverse images of critical points are not very, uh, or critical level sets are not really interesting because, uh, uh, because they are not smooth. So we prefer smooth category all the time, but passing. Uh, shouldn't should this be a half uh, closed interval to, to, for this to be the case? Otherwise the one is one point and the other is empty. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, shouldn't uh, it shouldn't it be a half closed interval? Otherwise, uh, the second... yes. Okay, yes, you're right. So this is uh, half open or half closed. It we can look at both. Thank you for this remark. Uh, so we increase C, and then what is really interesting is what happens when we cross the critical point. So when we cross the critical point, this guy you can see it's a sphere. It's a, it's a circle. We just have a circle that intersects the, the level sets like if we think of this sphere as an object in R3, it's uh, is a sphere and level sets are intersections of hyperplanes with the sphere. So this is a circle and this is a disk. Well, depending on whether we make a closed or uh, open, open or closed uh, mm, interval here, we, it's an open disk or a closed disk. So it's a disk all the time until we reach the other critical point. So for the other critical point, we have the level set is again like a, a point and a disk with a with a hole or sorry a sphere with a hole or a sphere depending on whether we close or or not. And then it's an empty set. This is an empty set where we are above the maximum, and this is everything. So another example is uh, a torus and a 
Tauros is uh, a bit more complex, but also nice. Let me be a bit more quick. So here is one critical level set. This is here we have another. So again, the function is the height function. Okay. Here is the third one, and here is the fourth one. Okay. And you can play the same game for any uh, surface. So below we have empty set and empty set. So this corresponds to the level set. This corresponds to that. Here we have a single circle and a disk. Here we have a pair of circles and an object that is like that. And here we have again a single circle and we have uh, something that looks like a, maybe I will try to make a bigger picture just to show my complete lack of ability to draw nice pictures. Okay, so Mm -hmm. So we have like an, is it right? It should be, it should be right. It should be a smooth oriented manifold. It looks like a basket, like a basket you can carry to, to the market if it's open in your country. Uh, and then if we are, uh, if we are above the level set, like over here, then this is empty again, and this is and this guy is everything. Okay, so let me just pass to another blackboard and try to see if I can do it smoothly. Maybe, maybe I, I need some info about the shortcut. I pass to another to another part. And so you see that the topology of these level sets changes as the critical as the the value. So the the value of the function passes through critical points. So first of all, we have to ask a question whether all critical points are, so there are two questions. First question is whether all, any critical point is allowed. So for example, any function is allowed, or maybe these functions were somehow special. So you see here, all the critical points uh, uh, were isolated. It's not necessarily the case for, and if you take any function, any smooth function from a manifold to, to real numbers, then you don't need you don't know whether critical points are isolated. The uh, complement of the set of the critical points, so the regular set is, uh, you know that it's uh, uh, full measure and uh, open dense and so on, but it can be very complicated. So for example, there can be infinitely many critical points and then you're screwed. So maybe there are some restrictions that are on the one hand, there are, these restrictions are needed. On the other hand, there are restrictions that we can live with. So that's first question. And the second question is how do we study, like how can we possibly compare the two critical level sets if um, at, uh, two critical level sets at two critical levels, if they are not, for example, not separated by a critical point. So first, let me address the first question. So, uh, uh, and the study of critical points is a local study. So a critical point is something that happens locally and we will apply local analysis. So local analysis means we work over manifolds. So over RM, not on manifolds. So I'll start with the definition, which is like definition. And this is a definition of a Morse critical point. Let F from Rn zero to R zero be a smooth function. 
And uh, if you're not familiar with this notation, it's uh, my laziness. So this notation means that Rn goes to Rn and zero goes to zero. And uh, I'm denoting zero in Rn by the same letter that zero in R, you have to uh, accept it as it is. Uh, it's, it should be clear from context. Be a smooth function and df of zero, zero, zero. So here I'm is zero, is a zero vector. So this at this moment, I make an exception to the rule I just said. So the, the derivative of f at zero is zero. If you prefer, you can say the gradient. I will tell you the difference between the gradient and the derivative, maybe during the, the lecture, maybe during the classes. But it's it's a subtle but important difference. Or you can write df or the most preferred notation for you, you can use. But the, the point is that it's a critical point. The point 0, 0 is a Morse critical point if df is a non degenerate matrix. So what is this? Just uh, just to fix the notation, uh, d square f is the matrix d square f dx1 dx1 uh, d square f. This should be yeah. dx1 dxn d square f dxn dx1 d square f dxn dxn. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, so this matrix is a symmetric matrix of the dimension of, of size n times n. So the mm -hmm. uh, so being non-degenerate means the determinant is non-zero. Okay, so this is a Morse definition of the Morse critical point. And of course, if you have uh, uh, mm, uh, if you have uh, um, another critical point, like at some other place or at some manifold, uh, then uh, the more definition of the most critical point means remark means that in some local coordinate system, it's a more critical, most critical point. A critical point Z of F is Morse if it is Morse in some coordinate system. And there is a trick here, which we are going to discuss during the classes. And this is a trick that if you work with local coordinate system, if you change coordinates, then you know that the derivative of a function is factorial. So it's, it behaves nicely if you have one coordinate system and another coordinate system, then the derivative uh, is uh, well defined. But the second derivative, oh, the remark didn't appear on the screen correctly. Oh, that's, that's a shame. And uh, why I stopped sharing? Uh, Mm, wait a second. I will first uh, export the page. Sorry for uh, being. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, huh? I'm sharing the. The lecture, and then I'm trying to see what happens with uh, with the 
uh, with the connection. I got disconnected from the from the from my tablet. Sorry. Uh, share content screen. Uh, start broadcast and and now I'm over here. Uh, can you see it? Uh, yes, you should be able to see it. And uh, the remark is uh, is not seen on the screen. I'm sorry. I, I need to know now that it's cut. Uh, a critical point is Morse if it is Morse in some coordinate system. And I started saying that the second derivative doesn't behave well under um, under coordinate change. So if you change coordinates, then the second derivative changes by, like gets conjugated by the coordinate system change, but there is some contribution from the derivatives of the coordinate change. But if we work, we restrict to critical points, then the derivative, the second derivative is factorial. That's a subtle, mo subtle moment, but it's like subtle technicality. It doesn't lead you too much. So that's why we postpone it for, for classes. And then there is a fantastic result. That's like a result that goes through, um, that is at the, at the core of the um, of more theory, well, two results. First result is like if we have a critical point that is of Morse type or Morse critical point, there are also notions like uh, non-degenerate critical points and so on. So, but usually the Morse critical point. Mm, then the mm, uh, then there are local coordinates such that this function behaves very nicely. We know what the function is. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that on every manifold, you can find a function that has only Morse critical points, which will be called the Morse function. So if you have a closed manifold, you, have, you can find, and actually the set of Morse functions is smooth. Mm. Mm. Sorry, it's open and dense, and so you can always find a Morse function in the manifold. Maybe this Morse function is very complicated, but anyway, it's always a Morse function. It, it's, it always has simple singularities. So let me start, state Morse lemma. Morse lemma. If f r n to r has a Morse critical point at, mm, let's say, at zero. But we don't insist that the critical value is zero. So that's the, the difference. Then there are local coordinate Mm -hmm. coordinates near zero, 0, So there is an open set uh, containing 0, 0, 0 uh, denoted by y1, yn. And an index k which can be from zero to n, such that f of y1, yn is equal f of zero, zero, zero. So this is the term that is not present if, uh, uh, if the critical value is zero plus, or sorry, minus. y1 square minus yk square plus yk plus 1 square plus yn square. Mm. The number k is called the index 
of the critical point. And it's independent on the local coordinate system. System. And remark if k is zero, then f has a local minimum k equals n, then f has a local maximum. So this is like uh, like uh, multivariable calculus. Uh, calculus exercise that the lem the more lemma tells you that if the let me come back if the second derivative is non degenerate then you can tell whether the function has a local minimum and local maximum so this is calculus too but the statement is a bit more general so if k is not zero or equal not equal to n then it is uh, uh, Mm, then it is uh, mm, a saddle point or a generalized saddle point, which are probably the most interesting. Okay, so let me just uh, tell you about the proof and then I will pass to the proof. Uh, the proof is that uh, essentially you, mm, mm, first of all, you want to change the function that d square f uh, to be a diagonal matrix. And that is what you can do. And you always can assume that d square f is the diagonal matrix with pluses and minuses on the diagonal. And in such a way that the minuses are at the beginning and the pluses are at the end. So this is like, and then there is this uh, famous uh, rule for calculus that what you can uh, that many things that you can do at the level of derivative, you can do locally uh, in local coordinates near, near the derivative. So the key point here will be the Hadamard lemma. Mm, mm, uh, let me just uh, try to export it. Uh, Google Drive. It's, uh, Next time I will do I, I will do I will give you the Dropbox link because it's this one is too fast. Uh, okay, so the key point will be the use of Hadamard lemma. But first, let me just record recall it just in case you don't know it. The lemma is due to Hadamard. Suppose f from rn to r satisfies f of 0, 0 is 0, then there exist functions g1, gn, and f is f is c1 smooth uh, such mm, if i write and say i such that mm, uh, f of x1 xn is equal x1 g1 of x1 xn plus x2 g2 x1 xn plus plus xn g of x1 xn okay and for those of you that know it means that like the ideal if you look at the ring of all smooth functions, then the 
functions uh, that vanish at, a, at one point, well, for uh, actually this, this is true for C infinity, the function that vanish at a given point form an ideal uh, that is uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, that is uh, finitely generated. The generators of the ideal are x1 up to xn, and this doesn't work for uh, just continuous functions. For continuous functions, the set of functions that vanish at a given point form an ideal that is not finitely generated. Okay. Uh, the, the regularity of g1, gn depends on the regularity of f as it can be seen by the proof and the proof is very simple uh, uh, proof consider fix x1 xn not equal zero zero Consider page that maps f. That is a one variable function that maps f to f to t x one t x n. Okay, and then f of x one x n is equal to h of one, and now. This is equal to h of one minus h of zero, which is equal to the integral of zero to one of d over dt of h of t. And the integral is over dt. So now is the integral of zero one d over dt f of t x one Txn dt. So this is equal to. Now we use the chain rule. This is a com composition of two functions. One function is going from t to f, so for t to these guys, and now these guys are mapped to f. So it is the integral of zero one, sum of y equal one to n. And now we have. df over dxi at the point tx1, txn times the differential, the derivative over t over the ith variable, which is xi, and the, the and is dt. So is equal to now. This is a finite sum. And xi is independent on the variables t. So this is like a constant because I'm working with the variables t. So I can put this xi outside of the integral sign. And I can put also the sum outside of the integral sign. So it is like sum i equal 1 to n xi, the integral over 0 to t. To, sorry, zero to one. Df of dxi at tx one txn dt. So now set gi is equal to uh, gi of x one xn set it to be equal to the integral over tf of dxi, tx1, txn, dt. Then f of x1, xn is x1 g of g1 of x1, xn plus xn g of x1, xn. So this is the end of the proof of the Hadamard lemma. Uh, some people have it uh, learn it during the classes on calculus, but not everybody. And, and you see that it's uh, really 
uh, important to have a smooth function like at least C1 because otherwise you can't uh, you can differentiate this function and or you can can't differentiate can't use the chain rule over here and so if f is like ck smooth then you know that the functions uh, g1 g2 are at least uh, k minus one uh, regularity maybe you can push this regularity further but uh, mm. I'm not sure. So now we pass to the proof of maybe next blackboard proof of the Morse lemma. And I will give you the proof via Hadamard's lemma, which is the most classical. There is another proof uh, due to Palais um, in uh, uh, another means essentially another, not just the proof that is. Um, different uh, different notation, different steps, but it's essentially different proof using differential equations. You can read it in the book of uh, Banyag and Hurtubis. Mm. So proof of the Morse lemma. Uh, one, for simplicity, assume that f of x1, uh, sorry, f of 0, 0 is uh, 0 and d square f 0, 0 is diagonal. So passing from non-diagonal coordinates to diagonal coordinates will be done during the classes. general case during classes. But this is really simple. So second, we have f of 0, 0. You see, we have f of 0, 0, 0 equals 0. So we use the Hadamard lemma. That's why I stated it. If you don't want to do, don't, don't know what to do is x1, g1 plus x2 g2 plus plus xn gn. And now I will do a little a tiny little trick. A trick. Write g i of x1 xn to be for i greater than one. So I will plan to like, my plan is to simplify the function uh, to like to use induction. And by induction, I mean, uh, I will try to define these coordinates one by one. And to this end, I will try to put the dependence on x1 only into the function g1, okay? So that g2, g3, and gn are independent on x1, okay? This will this is a proof that is uh, that goes uh, a bit uh, mm, is a bit lazy because it's but it's more transparent than some of the proofs that you can find in the literature. Uh, its drawback is that it uses C3. So it works in, you really have to, need to have uh, the function uh, C, uh, the function F being uh, C3 smooth. So it's not uh, totally classical. So I write a GI of X1, XN to EP equal G1, GI, XN minus gi of 0 x2 xn plus gi of 0 x2 xn. Well, I can always do this. Now I regard this guy as a new function. 
uh, as a function from x1, well, like with fixed variables x2 up to xn, I can look at this guy. And now I use Hadamard. Well, I use Hadamard with parameters, but it's perfectly fine to write gi of x1 xn minus gi of 0 x2 xn equals x1, let me say it, wi of x1 xn. Okay? And now you might wonder why I'm why I am allowed to do this, but I use the same argument as in Hadamard's lemma, and I get with the essentially the same definition, but I use it only with respect to one variable. Uh, uh, with one variable to have like x1 being in here. Okay, this is this is again Hadamard's. This is again Hadamard's lemma. Uh, is it okay? Because this is like using uh, parameters here. But the proof is the, the proof is when you trace the proof of Hadamard's lemma, it's the same. Um, uh, so we have um, replace. G1 by G1 plus X2 W2 plus X3 W3 plus Xn WN and GI by gi of zero x2 xn. Okay, so look what happens if I see this formula. I plug, I plug in this into that guy. So I get a term. So this gives me x1 vi x1 xn and plus gi zero x1 x x2 to xn. Okay. So this plus that. So I replace this by x2 times this and x1 times this, x, x2, x1 times this. So I have x1 and I can put this x1 into g1. So let me one more sentence. This is uh, a bit trickier. So x so x2 g2 for example is x2 g2 of 0 x2 xn plus x1 w2 of x1 xn is equal to x2 g2 of 0 x2 xn plus x1, x2, w2, okay? So this can go into the definition of g1. So you see the, in other words, and now you can realize that the decomposition in Hadamard's lemma was well-defined, you could get, was explicit, you could get explicit function, but it's not unique. So there is a, in mathematics, there are uh, each value of x1 separately. Uh, uh, and we can plug in this uh, constant that varies from the parameter into wi. Yes. But uh, the question is whether we'll uh, retain smoothness. Yes, of course. Because you see, you define when you have gi of x1 x2, xn minus, well, of course we go back, go down with smoothness. So that's why I assume that it's C3 because then uh, wi, uh, 
uh, wi is uh, is uh, c1 function okay, okay. Uh, so and when we multiply it by xi we get c2 we recover c2 because multiplying by x um, because the only non smoothness is uh, is uh, only at 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 zero so if you multiply it by x1 you gain one differentiability level but anyway you have This is the proof of the statement I'm using. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the not over dt here is over d. Uh, this is already over dx one. Okay, so this is the statement I'm using here. I de decrease. I lose. The, I lose differentiability. But I'm. I'm saying I'm like. Uh, uh, hmm, uh, it's not the, the optimal regularity that you can get from here. Okay, so I'm back in uh, the in the statement where I can write g1 x1 xn plus xn gn of x1 xn with x with gi not depending on x1 for i greater than z, greater than 1 okay that's what i and i ended up but now you see uh, what is the value of uh, G1 of 0, 0, or Gn of 0, 0, 0. What is this? So if you differentiate this guy at 0, differentiate and evaluate at 0, then you have the chain rule, the, the Leibniz rule for the, the derivative. So you have like x1 times derivative of this guy plus derivative of this guy times g1, okay, and so on and so on. But derivative of, uh, so for example, t over dx1 of fx1 xn at 0, 0, 0 is equal to x1 dx1 over dx1 g1 evaluated plus x1 dg1 over dx1 evaluated plus and so on. And now what you see? First of all, and okay, let me just write the second term. Mm, plus dx2 over dx1 g2 plus x2 dg2 over dx1 evaluated at 0, 0, 0. So what happens? No. So first, well, whenever you have a term x1 or x2 or xn and you put all the x's equal zero, then they they vanish. Okay. So this is zero. This is zero because of the evaluation. Now, whenever you have dx2, term, term like dx2 over dx1, when you differentiate one variable with respect to another, you get zero. Okay? So there, there's going to be only one non-zero term. This is non-zero. So this is g1 of 0, 0. Okay? So this is a simple computation. And actually, I'm warning you, or promising, depends on what you think, is that the 
all the lecture will be different than this calculation. So the Morse lemma is different than the than the most of the lectures uh, later on. Okay. So you have G one of zero zero. So this is uh, so then. You see, if your point, and that's what we had in here, in the Morse lemma, that the function has a Morse critical point at 0, 0, 0. So the der derivative is 0. So passing here, this guy is 0 at 0, 0, 0. So what we can do, we can do the Hadamard lemma once again. So g i of x1 xn is equal to h sum is equal to wait a second sum x i h i j of x one to x n. Okay. So now f of x one x n is equal to sum j h i j of x one xn and now there is one thing i don't want to go too much in detail so that's why this course is not for second year undergrads but it's for uh, like uh, at least people at least third year so play the same trick as above to conclude that to not to conclude to get that h i j doesn't depend on x one for I, I or J greater than one. And then we, that's where we used uh, regularity. So here is a remark. We have already proved that H I J doesn't depend on X one for I greater than one. Okay. Because ji for i greater than one didn't depend on x1, so uh, hij doesn't depend on x1 for i greater than one, but we need to take care of the case i equals one and j greater than one. Uh, that's leaving, uh, that's uh, an exercise for you. And then again, And the same reasoning as above reveals that H i j of zero zero is d f of d x i d x j at zero zero. Okay, that is uh, that is again the same the same statement as we did for on this blackboard. So I don't repeat it because it's more notation, but not the concept conceptually it's the same. Okay, so h i j of zero 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 is here, and now mm, uh, 
uh, and now we have uh, what do we need to have is uh, mm, Mm. Okay, so now we write, uh, sorry, now we know that hij of 0, 0, 0 is mm, mm, now as d is diagonal, uh, d square f is diagonal, we know that h i j of zero zero is not equal to zero for i not equal to j. In particular, for i uh, uh, equal one and j greater than one. That's what I insist. So now we can write where we are. We are at uh, is equal to zero. Uh, is equal to zero. Yes. Thank you. Now we write f of x one x n is equal to sum x i x j h i j of x one xn with h i j not depending on x1 for i equal for i J not equal one, one. And now we have one more simplification. Uh, write H one J of X one X N J greater than one to be H I J of X one X N minus H I J of zero x2 xn plus h i j of mm, 0 x2 xn uh, no, no 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 what I want to sorry I'm just this is the step that I that is simple but uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay Mm. Mm. I can write it as uh, like this. Mm. What was the uh, okay? Sorry. Some over L K one J L of X one X N and after uh, X L and this is this is a moment this is a this is a technical moment uh, because I want to no I will let me just do it right so this is the last step before we use implicit function theorem. So uh, sum over L X L uh, K one uh, K J L of X two up to X N. So then replace, play the same, the same trick once again. Uh, and that's why I say that the proof is lazy because it re relies on one trick repeated, repeated three times. Replace um, uh, H J L by uh, X one K J L and 
h one j by zero. Okay, so this guy, I apply it the third time the Hadamard's lemma. So that's a non-standard trick. Uh, H, X, L, K, J, L. And now I, in this formula, I will have X1, X, J, X, L times K, J, L. So instead of writing X1, X, J, uh, X, L, K, J, L with this inside H, I, J, I say, well, I replace H, I, A, J, L by, by X1, K, J, L and H1, J by zero. And in this way, I end up with the statement that fx1 xn is equal to x1 square h11 of x1 xn plus terms not containing x1 at all. So that was my goal. My goal was to write f as a quadratic function in H1 multiplied by some guy and terms that don't contain X2 and Xn at all. So you see that that was my trick from the beginning and now you see the, the plan like the plan was to like to control the behavior of the function f under x1. So I stripped the behavior of the function f for x1. And then I use, well, everything else, every other term in this formula, once I have replaced xjl by x1, xjl, all the terms are, uh, oh no, they are, they depend on x1. Mm. Sorry. Just got confused with the proof that I always thought. So that's I'm teaching the for the sec, for the fifth or sixth time, and I get confused with the proof that I, I have now. Define y one equal x1 times the sign of, I will come back to that later, so terms independent. I, let me write it that, that I can write it, but maybe I, maybe there is some, something that, I, that I'm missing here. So I can write it always as x1 plus x squared, so there is a little gap here. Uh, times sine of um, sine of h y one at zero zero times square root of h the absolute value of x one x n and y two is equal to x two and y n is equal to x n and then f of y one yn is equal to uh, plus or minus y1 square plus terms independent on y1. Okay, so this is the induction step. I get my y1 square plus or minus depending on the sign of this guy plus terms independent. So what I need to check, the last thing I need to check is that it is a legi legitimate, uh, le legitimate change of variables. But now you see, we assumed and we have never used these assumptions to this moment. We have never used the assumption that this function is, uh, that the, the f has non-degenerate uh, non uh, second derivative. If f has a non-degenerate second derivative, we can always, uh, we can guarantee that h1000 zero, zero, zero is non zero because the derivative of df is diagonal. And on the first term on the top 
left term, the first term on the diagonal is H1 of 0, 0, 0. So if it's 0, then the, der then the determinant of the second derivative is 0, and we are contradicting the assumption. So this is non zero. So this, you can use the implicit function theorem ex or an explicit, uh, explicit uh, inverse function, and you check that this is a smooth function in the neighborhood and write the explicit inverse or whatever you want. Mm, this is by implicit function theorem or inverse function theorem. Uh, this is the this is a change of variables. So you see, you went down with the number of variables by one until you get to a single variable function, which where this proof is done. So this is more or less up to this passage, which is like a technical gap. It's not really serious. This more lemma is proved. So there are variants of this Morse lemma. So we are going to, if you want to study Morse functions for manifolds with boundary, okay. So then you have, you need to control the variable that, be, that, the, that determines boundary. If you have a Morse function or a sub-manifold, you need to treat separately variables, normal variables and the tangent variables. They have to be treated separately. That's the same for like the immersed case. Or, but the Morse lemma tells you something more. For example, if the, this proof tells you something more, for example, if your function f has derivative, second derivative is zero, sorry, is uh, non-zero, uh, for example, it's diagonal with non-zeros and one simple zero, then you can play the same game to get like the, that your function is like sum of squares plus something that is a one variable function in more complex coordinate in, uh, in, in a more complex shape. So this gives you this gives you a more uh, uh, a more uh, much more than just the statement of the lemma. And if you uh, you learn this lemma when you want to adjust it to your situation and we are going to do that uh, later on. So this is like, and this is like a first part, first part, first thing. Morse lemma is uh, mm, mm, mm. Morse lemma is uh, like a pattern to prove more general Morse lemma type and but uh, usually not uh, not much more difficult. So then the there comes a definition, and maybe just before I pass to the definition, I will try to. Okay, Morse lemma is proved in the uh, in the Milner's book Morse theory, and the next lemma is proved also in that book. But if you want to learn Morse theory from any book, then the book has no Morse. Nothing. Uh, the best book for Morse theory has no name Morse in the title. It's Lectures on H Coborted Theorem by John Milner. There is much more about Morse theory in that book than in the book with title Morse theory. It was not my invention, sorry. Uh, so the slogan is Morse functions are open dense in the set of all smooth functions. Um, and so that this is a slogan. Now let me pr prove you first step of the slogan. So suppose I have a function f from rn to r. And lemma the set of L one Ln in Rn such that
D dot F plus L1 X1 plus Ln Xn is Morse is open dense and full measure and so on. So the regularity here depends on how well you know the SARD lemma and what you exactly want to do. But the proof is, uh, cons uh, if you look at this statement in a correct way, it's trivial. If you look at it in a non-correct way, it's wrong. So proof. Consider df. df is a map from R to Rn. And if you don't, you're not familiar with this statement. So this is df of x1, xn is equal to df over the x1 up to df over the xn. Okay? So this is the, um, this is the, the map. And now look what happens. Observation. And this is the Q observation. If you see this observation, if you understand it, then you understand anything, everything. Observation. A point F is Let me call this function G, okay? F is Morse if and only if zero, zero, zero is a regular value for G. And the regular value means the inverse image of an element in the uh, in the codomain of the function is a, uh, is a regular value if the inverse, all the inverse images are, none of the inverse images is a critical point. So what does it mean? Well, this is a really simple observation. It changes your point of view for the, for the purpose of the proof of the slogan or the proof of the lemma. So you have, uh, uh, Let's choose x1, xn. Such that g of x1, xn is 0, 0, 0. Then dg of x1, xn is uh, the matrix is equal to d square f of x1, xn. Okay, that's why I choose this is because of this definition. That's why I choose this. So being a regular value, being a non-singular point of x1, xn, means uh, that the derivative is a full rank, okay? Or the derivative is uh, like uh, monomorphism. But being a full rank here means that the determinant is non-zero. So x1, xn is a regular value, is a regular value of g if and only if d square of f is, uh, has no zero determinant. So this is dg. But then regular value means uh, mm, uh, this is basically the observation. Okay, so now once we have done this observation. Choose L1, Ln such that minus L1 minus Ln is a regular value of Dg. Mm. 
this is the most annoying thing in the proof is that you need to control the sign here. Consider uh, of G. Uh, G. Of, of G, yes, sure. Thank you. Uh, consider F of X1, Xn plus Lx, L1, X1 plus Ln, Xn. And then, and let me call it F tilde, then zero, zero, zero is a regular value of G tilde defined as DF tilde. So far, so good. Now, that means So this means F tilde is Morse. Okay, and now we use SART. To state that the set of regular values of G is open dense or, or uh, measure or, uh, or full measure or whatever you, whatever you want. Okay, so that's the statement. And now a problem. Use this argument to prove that Morse function functions on a manifold are open dense. I will add it to the uh, to the problems on the um, for for classes. So there are like on the web page there are problems for classes, and uh, I will gradually update it. But also adding problems that arise during the lectures that I never thought before that they are important. So. Uh, uh, so this uh, this will be added to the to the proof that it it really requires some attention and it's pretty technical. Milner also sli uh, slides over this uh, this problem. So it, he proves that Morse function exists, but just stating uh, stating this lemma. So if he does it, I of course uh, the. Mm -hmm. Saying that Morse functions exist means uh, nothing on saying how complicated they can be. So, for example, you can draw a sphere like this, or maybe even worse. And the function f is the height function, and now your sphere, maybe this is uh, this should be like that. Uh, it has plenty of singular points. It has a lot of singular points, and now you want to say, well, but it's a sphere, but it admits a function with a lot of singular points. So uh, during the course, we will at some moment learn how to simplify critical points, and this is like a part of the. Mm, proof of uh, of Smale's proof of Poincaré conjecture in dimension five and more that you can always simplify the function uh, by the way that is dictated by by the algebra. So there is some algebra associated with it, and the algebra tells you that maybe you can simplify, and then you can pass from algebra to topology to say well we can simplify. But before that, we need to pass to or come back. That's good that we have something left on the blackboard. We have a Morse function. So these two functions that I drew are Morse functions. So these are critical points of index zero. These are local minima. These are critical point of index points of index one. These are local maxima. 
and these are critical points of index, uh, sorry, index two, and these are of index one. They are like mm, uh, neither minima nor maxima, they are several points. And so the question is now, mm, mm, that I told you, we want to study what happens to the level set of, uh, of the function when we pass two critical points and what happens to the level set of function of the Morse function if we are between two critical level sets. So if nothing happens, then we should say nothing happens. So there is a statement which I uh, call, I usually call the nothing lemma. And lemma about nothing is that the statement that if nothing happens, then nothing happens, which means that if you are have two level sets and there's no critical point in between, then the uh, level sets are isotopic and the sub level sets are also isotopic and homeomorphic and diffeomorphic and regular. So we need to prove it and we need the tool to prove the uh, uh, to prove the uh, to prove this statement. So what is the proof? Main idea and the main tool, main tool number one, and then there will be a main tool number one prime, not number two. Main tool number two is vector fields. And gradients. So what is a gradient? So if you have a function f from rn to r, and I will dwell for a moment about it because no, 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 I don't expect everybody has uh, taken a course in differential geometry. So, and this is this is really important. So if you have a function f, well, smooth, then you can say what is the derivative? Well, you normally write going from R into R, but actually df of x, sorry, to Rn, uh, uh, sorry, the derivative is from Rn to R, so, or if you prefer from the tangent space to Rn to the tangent space of R, df of x is a map from, linear map from Rn to R, which is, the same as the dual space to Rn. You, some of you might have learned about the dual spaces, uh, like first year uh, linear algebra course, and but you really don't know, usually don't know what it is good for, and why do we use Rn in here, Rn star. But you can say, well, df, you say the gradient, df over dx1, df over dxn, but the gradient is a vector. So the gradient belongs to Rn. So many students and many professors just say, well, Rn star is the same as Rn, so we have write uh, tf as a column vector as a derivative, and the, this, this is the, uh, sorry, the, the row vector as a derivative, this is a column vector, and so we identify this with that. But actually, it's not true. When you identify the space Rn star with Rn, you uh, use an identification. Maybe implicit, maybe explicit. Some people are not aware of this identification. You use the scalar product. So this identification uses uses scalar product, okay? And there is a problem that I gave you on the list that the gradient is not functorial. So if you have like a base change, then the gradient doesn't come to the gradient usually unless the base change is orthogonal. And orthogonal means, tells you that in fact, you need to have, you use this identification. So you would like to have Coming back to the Morse function on a manifold, you would like to define a vector field that is a gradient. 
But you see, if you have uh, if you don't have any extra structure, then well, the gradient will depend on local coordinates. Okay, because the passing from the function to the from the derivative, which is a dual space to the space, requires a scalar product. So now there is a definition which you might know. A manifold, sorry, a Riemannian metric on a manifold M is the choice, a smooth choice. of a scalar product in each of the TXM. Okay, and what I mean by smooth, well, you have Like, for example, you can say that it's smooth if it's smooth in a local coordinate system, or you can define it as a smooth section of a bundle of a bundle that is like a, uh, some specific bundle. I don't, I don't want to write it down. So, uh, and the good thing is that every closed manifold admits a Riemannian metric. And the second statement is that definition a manifold with a choice of a metric is called a Riemannian. Oh, you don't see it. Mm. Is choice a Riemannian manifold? It's not hard to guess what it is. Okay, so you have gradient of a function as a vector field if your manifold is Riemannian. Uh, before I stop for today's lecture, let me just comment one thing. Why is it called a metric? If you learn topology, then the metric is something, well, you know. Uh, uh, mm, computing distance. If you have a Riemannian metric on a manifold, you know what is the length of the curve. Because you can integrate, you have a smooth curve embedded, you can integrate it by well, there is a formula in, involving the metric for the uh, for the length of the curve. But if you have a length of the curve, you define the metric as the minimum of curves um, on the uh, minimum of the length of curves connecting two points, and that gives you a real metric that you're familiar with on topology. So that's why it is called a metric. And uh, I will tell you what to do for Riemannian manifolds and for gradient vector fields. But then I will tell you that gradient vector fields are not the ideal tool for work to work. And I will tell you about the main tool number two, which is, which is called gradient-like vector fields. But in, in order to understand gradient-like vector fields, we need to understand the uh, gradient vector fields first. So thank you for today, for today's lecture.